Programming and Public Relations Specialist here at the Vermilion Public Library in South Dakota. And I am excited to be hosting a program with Evan Weiner with people from all over the country, it sounds like. Um, I, I do want to point out before uh, I introduce him that if you have any, you know, sounds going on in the background, be sure to mute your yourself so that those don't because every time if you if you have any sounds, they might kind of cut out and it gets it makes it harder for us to hear him. So um, if you're not actively speaking, you might want to mute, you, mute yourself just in case. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Evan, who is going to talk about the presidential impact on sports. Okay, thank you, Rochelle. Uh, my name is Evan Weiner. I've been uh, doing this sort of thing since I'm 15 years old. It was 1971. I was in high school, and uh, I was put on WRKL radio in uh, Mount Ivy, New York, and um, it was a high school show, and it sounded like a high school show. Uh, a guy by the name of Joe Dionisio was my uh, teacher in 11th grade. He didn't know my name, and to this day, he still doesn't even know we still talk to one another uh, 49 years later. He also opened the doors for me to work at uh, newspapers uh, at the Nyack New York Journal News and uh, Bergen County um, Record uh, in New Jersey. Uh, fast forward about uh, six and a half years later, I'm working at a five- I saw how many of them actually hit their goals, and the answer and is they all hit their goals. And the second part was how they were doing, and the answer was wrong goals. Work okay, sorry about that. Uh, in 1978, I'm working at a 500-watt radio station, and uh, my news director said, you need to go down to the Tappan Zee townhouse, and uh, the New York State Democrats are holding a fundraiser, and uh, John Lindsay, the former mayor of New York, uh, gave me my first scoop. I'm 21 years old, eight months out of college. He said he's running for Senate uh, from the state of New York in 1980, and um, that got me on uh, a big city station, WNEW in New York, uh, the home of William B. Williams, who gave Frank Sinatra his nickname, the chairman of the board. Uh, in 1980, when I was 23, I interviewed the candidate, Ronald Reagan, uh, when he was running for president, along with uh, Ted Kennedy, and uh, did a lot of uh, coverage of the New York State uh, Senate race. Um, so I have some background. Uh, I've interviewed Bill Clinton. I've interviewed Ronald Reagan. I've known Donald Trump since 1983. Uh, I knew George W. Bush, so I've known presidents. I've interviewed prime ministers of Canada and Malaysia and other people. Uh, the White House, presidential impact on society through sports. Now, it's probably something you never think of, but uh, presidents do matter when it comes to sports, and some of their decisions will have major impact on society. Uh, and that's my wife in front of the White House a couple of years ago. Um, and I figured it's the only picture of the White House I have right now, so I'll use it. Um, the first president I'm going to talk to about is uh, Andrew Johnson. He was president between 1895, actually April 15th, 1865, uh, rather, 1865 to 1869, uh, becoming president after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And he inherits a country that's split. In fact, he inherits a country that a number of states in the South, about 11 of them, had left the country. And the Civil War had just ended. And he's trying to figure out the way to mend the differences between the North and the South. And he's thinking about things. This is very early into his presidency. And he's got some advisors. And he liked baseball. And he decides, you know what, um, both sides, the North and the South, actually played baseball during the Civil War, during downtime. It's not the baseball that you look at today, what you see today. Baseball in the 1860s was vastly different. In fact, the catcher didn't even wear a catcher's mitt. Uh, he was barehanded. Uh, but Andrew Johnson is thinking about, you know, maybe, just maybe, just maybe, I could use baseball to help mend the country a little bit. And he meets with players from the Washington Nationals in the Brooklyn Atlantics at the White House. This is August 30th, 1865. And this is the first known official meeting between a president 
and an organized baseball team at the executive mansion. It wasn't very my sports uh, back in those days. Um, baseball, baseball was more than at that point, 26 years old, because it was not invented uh, by Abner Doubleday. In fact, if you go up to North Adams, Massachusetts, there's a baseball museum up there with an article uh, in a local paper from about 1792 about baseball being played in the Berkshires. But uh, Johnson was looking for something, just something to get the North and South together. Uh, and he liked baseball and he saw it uh, after the Civil War as an opportunity to unite the country national unity through baseball. His successor was Ulysses S. Grant, who really didn't do anything with sports, except he did one thing. Behind the White House, there was a baseball diamond, and Ulysses S. Grant used to leave the White House and go play baseball with the little kids in Washington, D.C. during his term as president between 18 69 in 1877. Now, Grover Cleveland, Grover Cleveland is the only president to win, lose, and then win the presidency. Uh, he met with Cap Anson and the Chicago White Sox, base, White Stockings baseball team. Uh, and he didn't meet them at the White House. He just met them uh, somewhere. And, uh, but Grover Cleveland didn't really care about sports. In fact, Grover Cleveland thought that sports was, was a frivolity. Uh, what do you imagine the American people uh, would think of me if I wasted my time going to a ball game? Benjamin Harrison was the first president to see a baseball game live, a major league game live, uh, the uh, National League. But uh, this is the guy, Theodore Roosevelt, who is thought to have saved college football. Now, football started, uh, the first game was Rutgers and Princeton. That was in 1869. Uh, I have a book called The Coal Miners Game, uh, talking about football and, and how we basically started in Western Pennsylvania and Ohio uh, in the coal mines, West Virginia. And uh, those were really, really tough, tough guys. And football was a very tough game. The game you see today in some ways doesn't resemble the game that was played in the 1890s in the turn of the century, 1900s. Um, football became a very dangerous game. Uh, between 1904 and 1905, or the 1904 and 1905 seasons, 22 players were killed on college fields in 22, and another 18 in 1905. So there were four, at least 40 deaths. Uh, there were many people that uh, suffered maiming injuries, including Roosevelt's son, both in high school and in college. Uh, here is the problem. Uh, in 1905, Theodore Roosevelt threatened to ban football in the United States unless rules were implemented to make the game safer after the reported 40 players had died from injuries on the field over a two-year period in 1904 and 1905. Of course, how you ban football that's another story because the president does not have the authority to just get rid of football. And besides, you're not going to go to some area in Pennsylvania and see a bunch of guys playing football and say, get off the football field. Maybe, maybe some colleges would drop it. But college football started in 1869 in the United States. So uh, even though he threatened banning the game, it's highly unlikely he had the ability to do so. So nobody could figure out how that could happen. Uh, but Roosevelt would call people down to the Oval Office, literally bang heads together, the uh, president of Harvard, the president of Princeton, and the president of Yale, and get them to make the game safer, which would ultimately lead to the formation of the National Collegiate Athletic Association. The president of Harvard, and Theodore Roosevelt, Charles Eliot, the president of Harvard, and Theodore Roosevelt did not like each other. In fact, Roosevelt actually hated Harvard, his alma mater. But he told him, get down to the Oval Office and you better fix the game or else. Uh, Roosevelt, everything that Charles Eliot stood for, he couldn't stand. Um, one thing that uh, Eliot wanted was uh, to either change football or just get rid of it entirely. Walter Camp the famous football coach, and there's still an annual dinner up in New Haven 
uh, for collegiate players, the best collegiate players of the year before, called the Walter Camp Dinner in uh, New Haven, and that's every uh, February in New Haven, Connecticut. Walter Camp and the Yale contingent said, no, football's fine the way it is. Let's keep it the way it is. And Princeton was on the fence. They could go either way. But Roosevelt got his way. Now, back in those days, if you got the newspapers, and there were many newspapers back in those days compared to today, you might see a, a cartoon like this, The Twelfth Man. And take a look at that football. Take a close look at that football uh, that uh, the skeleton is hiking. It doesn't look like today's football, and it wasn't today's football. It was watermelon-shaped uh, as opposed to football. The twelfth man, death. There's a, a skull and crossbones. There's a skeleton. The twelfth player in every football game, death. And people were talking about that. That's why Roosevelt was so involved in this. How did this game become so dangerous where college kids were getting killed on the field? Roosevelt, I demand that football change its rules or be abolished. Change the game or forsake it. Theodore Roosevelt Jr. suffered major injuries in high school and college. Now, you got to remember something about Roosevelt. He was sickly as a child. He became a great outdoorsman. Really, he, was, he thought that uh, exercise was the way to go. It helped him. It should help other people. So, I'm not too sure that Theodore Roosevelt ever really wanted to ban football. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, his son, Theodore Roosevelt, played football. Two, he hated Charles Elliott. And three, the Rough Riders. Now, Theodore Roosevelt was the assistant secretary of the Navy in 1898, and he went to fight uh, in the Spanish-American War. And he had the Rough Riders, and he went up San Juan Hill with, and he has a soft spot for the game because 10 of the Rough Riders, the soldiers who fought with him in Cuba, listed their occupations as football players in 1898. So he has some rooting interest in football players because 10 of his comrades helped him in the Spanish-American War. Um, Roosevelt got his way. The American Football Rules Committee was formed and by 1906, they came up with a whole new set of rules that uh, plays were designed to open up the game. You couldn't forward pass the game. You could lateral the game. They changed the football. They allowed the quarterbacks or whoever else was back there in, in whatever formation to throw the ball ahead. And they thought it would make the game less dangerous to play if they had these kind of rules. Uh, literally, the flying wedge was the flying wedge where you could pick up somebody and throw them for first down because the distance from for first down was first down five yards to go. They moved it back to 10 yards to go. Mass formations and gang tackling were bad. Now, did it make the game safer? There's that debate all these years later, 115 years later, because of the concussion injuries and the brain injuries that have taken place throughout the years. So yeah, it made the game safer that people weren't necessarily dying on the field in the numbers, but um, we now know about CTE and brain damage and how football uh, does impact the brain. Uh, and, and in 2014, Barack Obama called people to the White House to talk about that. And he didn't know about Roosevelt's initiative in 1905. William Howard Taft. Well, William Howard Taft really didn't do anything in sports, but, but, there's a good story behind here because William Howard Taft is responsible for both the presidential first pitch and probably the seventh inning stretch. And uh, that all came out of the women wanting the right to vote. See, on April 14th, 1910, uh, William Howard Taft had a number of suffragettes uh, at the White House because there was a suffragette convention in Washington with women asking everybody they can, why aren't we voting? Give us the right to vote. Why can't you give us the right to vote? And they have a meeting with William Howard Taft on April 14th, 1910. Uh, on that day, he would go to the baseball game in Washington throughout the first pitch. Now, why was he at the baseball game when he was not supposed to be at the baseball game? Well, 
the women were in the Oval Office and they kept saying, hey, Mr. President, why can't we vote? What's wrong with us voting? I don't see the problem why women shouldn't vote. Women like me should be out there voting. I don't see why. And Taft tried to dismiss him out of hand. He had no interest in seeing women voting. He has a bad day at the office. These women keep telling him, we want to vote, we want to vote, we want to vote, we want to vote. He has a bad day and he gets one of his aides, slips the aides note and says, get me out of here, take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the ball game was written in 1908. It might have been one of the first women's liberation songs written by two men, Jack Norworth and Albert Von Tilzer, because it is the woman, Katie Casey, yelling, take me out to the ball game. And women didn't go to baseball games. As a rule, in the 19 teens or before because baseball was seen as a, a game played by ruffians and, and you know low life guys um katie casey wants to go to a baseball game uh so taft says get me out of here take me out to the ball game i need to go to the game because i have to lift my spirits and the spirits of my staff were getting inundated by these women we want to vote well, he does go to the baseball game. They uh, hurriedly give him a place to sit, put the bunting out, and William Howard Taft throws the first ball out on April 14, 1910, and starts a presidential uh, tradition of presidents throwing out the first ball of the baseball season. And if you take a look at that crowd, there are not very, women in, very many women in that crowd, and those were the best seats in the house. There's a woman next to Taft. There's a woman behind her. And there's one to Taft's right in the picture. Uh, Taft was a big man, he weighed 300 pounds or more. And the legend has it, he decided to stretch between innings, the seventh inning, because he felt cramped. He was a guy who got stuck in the White House bathtub. Now, back in those days, the seats, the seats were just 19 inches across. Today, they're 23 inches across. If you want to relive the Taft experience, go to Fenway Park, because those seats are still 19 inches instead of 23 inches. Now he gets up in between the top of the seventh inning and the bottom of the seventh inning, and people have their eyes on the president and they get up and shine in the sign of respect because they think he's leaving. So everybody stands up, but he's not leaving. He's just stretching a little bit and he sits down and everybody else sits down. The seventh inning stretch, a baseball tradition well, it may not have started there. It may have started in the 1890s, but it caught a lot of momentum uh, from William Howard Taft. And we have the seventh inning stretch. It doesn't have a great impact on society, but it's a pretty good story because it involves the women suffragettes who would get the right to vote 10 years later, the 1920 presidential election. Woodrow Wilson in World War I. Well, Woodrow Wilson took, uh, took some time to look at baseball to get his song, one of his songs played. That song, The Star-Spangled Banner. Uh, the Star-Spangled Banner was sitting around, it was played at uh, Army and Navy bases uh, in the 1890s to lower the flag. It was a song that was around since about 1814. Uh, at the Battle of Fort William McHenry in, in Baltimore. Uh, baseball during uh, the Wilson years during World War I was considered non-essential. The Army General Enoch Crowder convinced Newton Baker, the U.S. Secretary of War at the time, that any draft-eligible men employed in non-essential jobs should be forced to choose, enlist to help stateside, or, go, uh, or risk going to the front lines in Europe. Baseball was considered totally non-essential. Again, the players were considered ruffians. Um, well, Hank Gowdy, who was the catcher with the Boston Braves, decided to enlist immediately. He was the first one to go into World War I. Wilson, at this point, is also forming a propaganda unit. Uh, this war, the United States gets involved in 1917. Uh, the 1918 World Series was played in September. Uh, there was a compromise between the American League and the National League uh, to shorten the season because of the war. It didn't have anything to do with Spanish flu. Many players enlisted in the war effort. Uh, Hank Gowdy, as I said, was the first to enlist. The American League, of which the Boston Red Sox are, didn't want to play. Uh, the National League owners did. The Chicago uh, Cubs 
course, were in the National League. And that was a pretty good thing for the Red Sox because they won their last World Series in the 20th century behind the left arm of Babe Ruth, the pitcher, the same pitcher who won 88 games, who ended up hitting 714 home runs. Uh, the Red Sox would win the World Series that year. But Wilson had some more things in mind. We're, we're at war, of course. And here's a poster from those days. It's Uncle Sam playing baseball. And it's part of the propaganda campaign that Wilson starts to get into the game, to get into the war. Uh, there was a committee on public information that was created by Wilson. Uh, the national anthem wasn't the national anthem at that point. Uh, it was the Star Spangled Banner. It was 14, 13 years away from becoming the national anthem. And it was played at the Red Sox games at Fenway Park during the World Series. But the Star Spangled Banner has kind of an interesting history with baseball because it was played in 1897 at opening day ceremonies in Philadelphia. And in 1898, at the Polo Grounds in New York, the song was also played. Then it was forgotten. And it was forgotten until World War I. A U.S. military band was on hand game one of the 1918 World Series. And during the seventh inning stretch that evening, and actually it wasn't evening, it was afternoon. They played afternoon games. But it was getting... Um, it was getting late early out there, as Yogi would say. The sunset was about uh, 6.15, so it was getting to evening. Anyway, um, it played an impromptu rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. The regular playing of the song starts in 1918, and other teams would begin to play the national anthem. The last holdout was the Chicago Cubs, and they would eventually play it. It wasn't the national anthem, it's just Star Spangled Banner. In 1931, it becomes the national anthem. Herbert Hoover really didn't do much in sports, uh, but there's a funny story there. Uh, the Babe, Babe Ruth, 1932. Babe Ruth wants to make $80,000 a year with the Yankees, which was a lot of money during the Depression. And uh, Babe is having this news conference with the wise guys from the New York media. Uh, there were about 11 papers in New York at that time. And he's talking about the 1932 contract talks. He wants more money than Hoover. So somebody, one of the reporters says, hey, babe, you'll make more money than Hoover. And he says, what the hell's Hoover got to do with this? Anyway, I had a better year than he did. This is where the laughter starts when I'm reversing. Hoover did do one thing that did impact sports and movies and entertainment and Broadway and dance halls and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, in 1932, uh, during the Depression, um, raise money, you got to raise money somehow. Uh, and he thought the way to do that would be an amusement tax, a levy that was designed to raise more money for the United States government in the fight against the De Great Depression. Uh, it hurt baseball attendance. Um, it hurt football attendance as well, some hockey. Uh, there was no basketball, to, so to speak, in those days. Uh, it hurt Broadway. It hurt the movies and entertainment in general. It was a flop. And, of course, Hoover was not reelected in 1932. He was Franklin Roosevelt. And I was up in Hyde Park uh, three years ago, actually, this week. Uh, in September of uh, 2017, Hyde Park, New York, the Roosevelt Presidential Library. And I had to talk to Franklin Roosevelt about a couple of things, actually three things. He and Eleanor, they were great hosts, they were smiling, they were upbeat, they had books for us to read, but I had to get down to the point. I needed answers to a few things. For instance, I give a talk on the 1936 Olympics, the Hitler Olympics, and I wanted to know from FDR why he legitimized the Hitler regime why he allowed the United States Olympic team to go to Berlin in 1936. I also wanted to know, what was it for Roosevelt? What was it like to be the first guy on television in the United States, April 30th, 1939? I do a talk. I do a talk on the 1936 Olympics. I do a talk on the early days of TV. Roosevelt was the first guy on TV welcoming people to the 1939 World's Fair in Flushing, Queens. And I also wanted to know about the green light letter that he wrote in 1942, 
where he allowed baseball and other sports to play. But first things first, the 1936 Olympics. Uh, in 1935, the former assistant secretary for the United States Navy, Ernest Lee Jenke, and Jeremiah Mahoney, Judge Mahoney, pushed for an American boycott of the 1936 Berlin Summer Games. This starts in November of 1935. Jenke was an American International Olympic Committee delegate and he was outraged with the reports of what was happening within Hitler's Germany, taking away the rights from the Jews, taking away the rights from the Roma or Gypsy people and uh, homosexuals among others that uh, he was, there were human rights violations. Uh, on November 25th, uh, Jenke writes a letter to the International Olympic Committee President, Count Henri Vallée Latour, floating the initial idea of an American boycott of the 1936 Summer Games. On December 8th, 1935, Judge Mahoney makes a speech, he's the head of the Amateur Athletic Union, saying that the United States should boycott the 1935 Olympics. Uh, Jenke never heard back from Latour. Um, Mahoney recommends America drops out. A number of United States Catholic leaders join with Mahoney, including the governor of New York, Al Smith, and the governor of Massachusetts, James Gurley, calling for a boycott. They're going across the country saying that the United States needs not to send a team to Berlin. Uh, the Berlin or Hitler Olympics was politically charged. Roosevelt would urge the American team to go to the Berlin Games, knowing full well about the strangulation of Jewish rights in Germany, along with others. Uh, I worked with Marty Glickman, who is one of the two Jewish athletes that was pulled from the 4x4 relay in the 1936 Olympics. Uh, I knew him, and I knew uh, I worked with Marty, and I knew Sam Stoller. Uh, and I talked to Marty about it, and he said Avery Brundage was behind it. But Marty agreed with Franklin Roosevelt, go to Berlin, because he, the fastest kid in Brooklyn, he was 18 years old, a brash kid on the, on the 4x4 relay, knowing he was going to win a gold medal. He, he uh, wanted to go to, to get up on the podium and stick that medal in the Fuhrer's face. Um, Roosevelt thought it was a good idea just to go. And there is Marty Glickman, 18 years old at the time, Sam Stoller, who was 21. And I got to know both of them. I got to work with Marty in the 1980s. Pearl Harbor came about December 7th, 1941. I do a talk on baseball uh, as well. And I wanted to know from Roosevelt, why are you playing baseball? Well, so the, Ken, uh, the baseball commissioner, Ken Sir Mountain Landis, can I play baseball? And um, Landis sends a letter to Franklin Roosevelt explaining we stopped playing baseball in 1918 because of World War I. What should we do here in World War II? Do we have the green light to play? And Roosevelt says, play ball. Uh, there is something called the green light letter. It's on display up in uh, Cooperstown now, as opposed to Hyde Park, which is about two and a half hours away from Cooperstown uh, in upstate New York. Uh, there will be fewer people unemployed, Roosevelt wrote back to Landis, and everybody will work longer hours and harder than ever before. And that means they ought to have a chance for recreation and for taking their minds off their work even more than ever before. Uh, I spoke to Dan Rooney, who was the president of the Pittsburgh Steelers about 15 years ago, and we talked about the green light letter. And he said when Roosevelt gave baseball the okay to play, he gave the National Football League, at least in our minds, and Dan's father, Art, was the owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers back in, in the 1930s and 40s, in our mind, that gave the National Football League the right to play football. Uh, for Pittsburgh, it was, a, it was a bit dicey because there weren't enough players in the Pittsburgh area to field the team. So they combined with Philadelphia Eagles because the Eagle players were part of the Navy and the Navy base in Philadelphia. That was 1943. In 1944, they went in with the Chicago Cardinals because of the Great Lakes Naval Station uh, because they didn't have players in Pittsburgh. But he said, it was us, it was National Hockey League, whatever basketball league was around, which was National Basketball League at the time. It was golf and it was tennis that played because Roosevelt said play ball. Ike Eisenhower 
Dwight Eisenhower. Now, Dwight Eisenhower didn't have that much of an impact on sports per se. Uh, he was a golfer. That's what he did. He was a he played uh, for the uh, U.S. Military Academy back in the 19 teens. Uh, he was a football player while he was attending school there. Uh, but he's in the middle of the Cold War. And he is looking around to see if he could find some common ground with Nikita Khrushchev uh, and do something to get America and the Soviet Union at least talking to one another and trying to, to simmer down the temperatures in the Cold War. And he comes up with an idea of sending a hockey team and a field and track team to Moscow and in exchange and I was a little kid back in the 1960s, and I loved this. In exchange for the Bolshoi Ballet, they were always on Ed Sullivan, and care for the ballet. But I liked the dancing bears from the Moscow Circus. They came over as part of this initiative. Eisenhower is looking to make the Soviets a bit more friendly and make the Americans a bit more friendly to the Soviets. And I got the dancing bears. I was really happy about that. But I got the story from a, a guy by the name of Bill Cleary in Rockefeller Center at the skating rink in uh, Rockefeller Center in Midtown Manhattan. It's 1995. And uh, there was a party honoring both the 1960 United States Olympic hockey team champions uh, from the, from the uh, Score Valley Olympics and the Lake Placid 1980 Olympic champions uh, from Lake Placid. So Cleary uh, and I are talking, and Bill said, did you ever hear the story about us? I said, what story? He said, the story about us going to Moscow. I said, no, I haven't. He said, oh, let me tell you the story. Bill Cleary played on the 56 and 1960s United States, 1960 United States Olympics. And he says, let me tell you this story, because you're going to laugh hearing this. He says, we get, we're, we're a bunch of firemen. We're a bunch of college kids. You know, you know, we're, that's what we are. You know, we're not professional hockey players. But Eisenhower calls us together, and he's sending us to Moscow. So we get to Moscow. We land at the airport. And we're going to a first-class hotel in, I've been in Russia, and I can tell you, if it's modern, neo-classical Russian Soviet architecture, it's in gray. It's dull, because they only had gray paint. That's what everything looked like. It was all dull, gray. I have pictures of that, too. Anyway, so clearly says, so they land at the airport, they go to the hotel, and they go up uh, into uh, their rooms, and they're looking for listening devices like that. They're going through the curtains and they're moving uh, all the beds around to see if there are bugs there. And then they're called to dinner. And he says, so they get together and they go into this main ballroom and they walk in and it's all, it's a state dinner for them. And they got uh, the knives here and the forks there and the spoons there and the plates are there and the soup plates are there. And they look into the soup plates and what's there? There's a little model of Sputnik, Sputnik, which went up in 1957. And he said, it was a reminder to us, it was a, an intimidation tactic to us that the Soviets got into space before we did. And they were reminded when they looked down at their soup plate and the guy came out to pour the soup, he had to take the Sputnik out. I never asked Cleary if he kept the Sputnik or not. Uh, but he said they did it as an intimidation tactic. Now, remember this. Richard Nixon was Dwight Eisenhower's vice president while this is all going on. It ended up the National Hockey League would also send teams, uh, the New York Rangers and the Boston Bruins, uh, to the Soviet Union on a goodwill tour. Uh, the NHL back in those days used to eliminate uh, the Rangers and the Bruins and uh, whoever lost the first round of the playoffs. They sent the players like Bobby Hull uh, to uh, supplement the Rangers and Bruins. And there is Sputnik. Sputnik was a little beach ball. That was basically it. It's 180 pounds stuffed with wires. John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy had a short reign as president. Uh, it was uh, January 20th, 1961 to November 22nd, 1963. But he did a couple things in sports. And the things he did in sports have a lasting impact and actually changed the game. Uh, the Sports Broadcast Act of 1961. That is the permanent impression that has not changed in sports. 
It has been steady since 1961 with some variations since then. But what John F. Kennedy's signature did in 1961 was create what would become a massive revenue stream for sports owners from television by signing the Sports Broadcast Act of 1961. And thank you for being here. We're going up against an NFL game right now. The NFL gets something like $22 billion over an eight year period from television, $22 billion, something uh, around uh, that uh, in rights fees. And that's John F. Kennedy did that. Now, he wasn't responsible for the actual legislation. There was a Brooklyn congressman by the name of Emanuel Seller, who I think started around, uh, around the time of the War of 1812. He was an old, old, old guy, but he wrote the bill. He gets no credit for it, but he's the guy who should be in every sports hall of fame because he writes this bill, which allows the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, Major League Soccer, college football to act as a monopoly when it comes to TV. This is what he did in 1961. The seller bill allowed the National Football League to market its broadcast rights as a league package. It was in 1961, 14 teams, not the 32 as today. And what that did was evenly spread out broadcasting revenues among the franchises, which guaranteed each team substantial revenues. It also meant that the New York Giants and the Los Angeles Rams and the Chicago Bears got the same money as the Green Bay Packers, the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the Baltimore Colts. Because prior to all this, the Giants, the Rams, Washington, Chicago, Cleveland had big networks. Green Bay had Wisconsin. Baltimore and Pittsburgh, they had kind of a slither that ran down into Tennessee. They weren't getting much TV money. That changes it because he socialized it for everybody. And there is Emanuel Seller, who did the NFL a solid favor in 1961, and the NFL would need him again in 1966. It changed sports. Major League Baseball had an antitrust exemption given to them by the Supreme Court of the United States in 1922 which basically said that, you know, they were a game. They were in an interstate business, even though the Brooklyn, New York Dodgers could play the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania Pirates. And you would think that would be interstate business. But according to the Supreme Court of the United States in 1922, baseball was a game. So let's make it exempt from antitrust laws. The other thing that John Kennedy did, he desegregated the Washington National Football League team. Now, the guy you're looking at is George Preston Marshall. He was the owner of the Boston team that started in 1932. He moved to Washington in 1937, and uh, the National Football League did not have Negro players between 1933 and 1945. And it is thought that it was George Preston Marshall's influence that ended for that 12-year period ended African-Americans in the league. Uh, and he might have been aided and abetted by George House, at least uh, Fritz Pollard uh, alleged that. Uh, George Preston Marshall was playing at an old stadium, Griffith Stadium in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, he didn't hire Negro players for his NFL team. Uh, Maury Povich, you know who Maury Povich is, right? Uh, Maury Povich, who does that Who's Your Daddy show? That's shot up in Stanford, Connecticut, about uh, 28 miles from me. Places where I speak up there. And you could go up there or used to be able to go up there on Wednesday and they would have a party before Maury's show would go on. Uh, I don't know how they're taping it this year. Uh, but anyway, uh, with COVID. But anyway, um, Maury's father, Shirley Povich, was the sports editor of the Washington Post. And Shirley Povich used to ask George Preston Marshall, when are you going to desegregate? When are you going to have a Negro player? And George Preston Marshall said, when the Harlem Globetrotters have a white player, we'll have an African-American player. He didn't hire Negro players. He was the last holdout. He was actually the last holdout in Major League Baseball, National Football League, National Basketball Association, and the National Hockey League. Uh, Marshall wanted a new stadium. The old stadium, Griffith Stadium, wasn't making enough money for him. The seating capacity wasn't that big. And this would be a brand new stadium he could use starting in 1962. Well, Marshall does hire a Negro player, not because he wants to, but he wants the money. And he wants to move into a new stadium. 
and the Kennedy administration puts the pressure on him. It's a federally funded stadium. If you do any big project in Washington, D.C., you got to have the feds on board. They're on board, 1962, and they remind George Preston Marshall, federal money, equal opportunity work requirements. The federal government decided to build a multi-purpose stadium in Washington for baseball's American League senators uh, and to uh, replace Griffith Stadium along, or to replace Griffith Stadium along with George Preston Marshall's team. There's John F. Kennedy, there is Stuart Udell. Stuart Udell is the Secretary of the Interior and they put the full court press on George Preston Marshall. The stadium would force Marshall's hand. Uh, Kennedy Secretary of the Interior, Udell, told Marshall, if you want to play there, you have to obey the legislation that prohibits discrimination in federal facilities. DC Stadium was a federal facility. The ultimatum, hire a Negro player or find somewhere else to play. George Preston Marshall would draft Ernie Davis as his number one pick, the running back out of the University of Syracuse or Syracuse University. And then he would trade Ernie Davis to the Cleveland Browns for Bobby Mitchell. The best thing that ever happened to Bobby Mitchell because he gets to Washington and he's the guy. There is no big party in Washington without Bobby Mitchell from 1962 into the 21st century. Bobby Mitchell was a hell of a nice guy. Wanted to be a dentist, uh, but this football thing got in the way and he had a good life because of football. Marshall was able to sign a 30-year lease with the federal government by picking Davis, and he basically shut up the Kennedy administration and he makes the trade for Bobby Mitchell in a first round pick after the 1962 draft. And he has his new stadium and the Kennedy administration gets George Preston Marshall to finally desegregate. Uh, Kennedy also brought back a tradition. Uh, winning teams coming to the White House, or well, teams coming to the White House since it hadn't been done since Andrew Johnson, and there he is with the Boston Celtics. There's Red Arback. Red Arback got State Department approval in 1964 to have a tour of Europe. It ended in Egypt. It was supposed to end in Moscow because Red Arback wanted to bring his Boston Celtics with Bob Pettit and some other players to Red Square to play the Soviet national team and beat them. Khrushchev didn't want them. They left him in uh, Cairo, and that's where they ended their tour. But uh, that's the Boston Celtics, 1963. Lyndon Johnson's responsible for the Super Bowl. Hmm? Yes, he is. He is responsible for the Super Bowl. He signs legislation November 8th, 1966, that allowed the merger of the National Football League and the American Football League. And you got to remember, Kennedy could have vetoed the Sports uh, Broadcast Act of 61 if he wanted to, and Lyndon Johnson could have vetoed the American Football League, National Football League merger, which started on uh, June 8th, 1966. But the roots of the Super Bowl go back, go back three years, two years. Lyndon Johnson signs the 1966 bill that would ultimately create the Super Bowl. Much of the legwork from the bill came from Emanuel Seller, who did the NFL a solid favor in 1961, and two Louisiana politicians, Russell Long and the Congressman Hale Boggs, Pokey Roberts' father. The Super Bowl was created in part because of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Now you're going to ask me, how did this happen this way? I'm going to tell you. The Super Bowl roots can be traced back to a game that was never played. The 1965 American Football League All-Star Game in New Orleans. 22 African-American players boycotted the game in New Orleans and it set off a series of events that concluded in the first championship game between the American Football League and the National Football League nearly two years later. This boycott was the players on their own and they were helped by their white teammates. There's no Martin Luther King involved. There's no Ralph Abernathy involved. None of these people are involved. These are the guys who put their careers on the line because they couldn't take Jim Crow anymore. 
Despite the passage of the Civil Rights Act, which was signed into law July 1964 by Lyndon Johnson, despite that, players were denied cab rides into New Orleans. They were called names, the players of 22 African American players. Two players from the San Diego Chargers, Ernie Lagg, six foot nine, 315 pounds, went to school in Louisiana at Grambling, and Earl Faison tried to go into a bar on Bourbon Street once they got into town. When they get into town, I'll tell you how they get into town in a minute. Um, they, tried to get in, they tried to go to a bar. The bouncer, who was not very big, said, ah, I wouldn't go in there if I were you. We're going. We're going. I wouldn't go in there if I were you. He pulls out a gun on them. They leave. They go back to the Roosevelt Hotel and the Hotel Fountain Blue. 22 players were stranded at the airport. They couldn't get cabs. Now, the governor of Louisiana, the mayor of New Orleans, Dave Dixon, was promoting the game because they thought if they had the game in New Orleans at halftime, the American Football League would announce New Orleans would have a team. They all assured the American Football League, Lamar Hunt and Bud Adams, that Negro players were going to be accepted. In 1961, a guy by the name of Walter Beach with the Boston Patriots, uh, the Boston Patriots were playing preseason game in New Orleans. He said, I'm not going unless I have equal treatment to my white teammates. They fired him, the Boston Patriots called him a troublemaker. Cookie Gilchrist is hearing the stories of the 22 players stuck at the airport. Uh, Cookie was able to get to his hotel because Jack Kemp, who ran for vice president in 1996, guy who I started knowing in 1979, if you were in New Orleans, and if you were colored, and if a white person said, he's with me, you could share a cab. You couldn't get a cab otherwise. Cookie's hearing some of these stories. And he decides, going back to his room, that they need to talk to the other players. Um, there would be all 22 of the players got together. The white players were left out. Jack Kemp, who is the president of the American Football League Players Association, said, whatever you do, we got you back. Which is amazing, because Jack Kemp was a Barry Goldwater campaigner in 1964. He put his political career his future political career on the line, and his pro football career on the line. There was a boycott. The game was moved to New Orleans. New Orleans never got an AFL team. But when the two leagues merged in 1966, New Orleans became a political football. Pete Rozelle, the commissioner of the NFL, commissioners or lobbyists, was sent down to Washington. He had two guys he needed to talk to. One was the senator, Russell Long. He was the fifth most powerful Democrat uh, in Congress at that time. Uh, rather, the Senate at that time uh, it was a democratically controlled body. He had to meet with him, and he had to meet with Hale Boggs, and he had to sell the merger. And he says, you know, we need this merger to save football. We need this because we're spending too much money, whatever he was telling him. And Russell Long and Hale Boggs both said to him, well, you know, we sympathize with your plight, but what's it do for New Orleans? doesn't do anything for New Orleans. Um, Roselle said, listen. I'll get back to you. And there is Pete Rozelle, and there is me. That's 1986. That's uh, the courthouse in Foley Square, New York uh, Federal District, Southern District. Uh, and that was the USFL, NFL uh, antitrust trial. And Pete taught me a lot of what you're hearing today. I heard a lot from Pete uh, back in those days and why he, I was 30 years old at the time, but I knew him before that, and why he talked to me, I could never figure out but apparently there was something funny that was going on, and that was uh, a picture of me and him in Fortune magazine. So Roselle lobbies them, and he has this problem. They don't see how this merger would benefit New Orleans. A deal is cut. We'll give you an expansion team for New Orleans. You give us the votes. Not only your votes, but votes in Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Eastern Texas, uh, in Tennessee. Deal? Deal. Good. You get the team, soon as you, 10 days after you pass whatever legislation you pass, 
we'll give you the team. Well, they passed the legislation on October 22nd, 1966, 10 days later or so, it's Halloween, actually it's the 21st. So they said, you know, we're not gonna do this on Halloween. Hey, we'll do it on November 1st, All Saints Day. That's when they got their team in New Orleans, All Saints Day. But it wasn't just those two guys. There was some other political maneuvering that had to take place. Seller, 15 NFL teams, nine AFL teams. They have to stay where they are in 1966. Seller, selfishly, the New York Jets football team was over in Queens. It wasn't in this district, but there were a lot of people in Brooklyn in this district that went to see Jets games. And he wasn't too happy with the NFL suggesting moving Joe Namath and the Jets to Los Angeles, moving the Los Angeles Rams of Daniel Reeves to San Diego, taking Baron Hilton's San Diego Chargers, moving them to New Orleans, which would have been good because Hilton had business interests in New Orleans, and then figuring out what to do with Oakland because she didn't want the two New York teams there and he didn't want San Francisco and Oakland to share the same market. He didn't want to do that. Well, um, Seller said, you listen to me or this is dead. They listened to him. And that creates the Super Bowl. Uh, January 15th, 1967, the American Football League, National Football League championship game between the Green Bay Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs. Green Bay would win that game. It would be the last uh, AFL, NFL championship slash Super Bowl game not to be sold out. And one of the reasons it wasn't sold out, they had 32 days, uh, 32 days to put together that game. Um, and that was Lyndon Johnson's legacy in football. Nixon was heavily involved, heavily involved. Now, I knew Dick Nixon. Yeah, I, I knew him. Nixon comes back into prominence in 1985 because he's the arbitrator of the dispute between Major League Baseball's umpires and the Major League owners. Uh, Richie Phillips, uh, and I was covering this at the time, which is where I got to know Nixon, and I spent about four years around Nixon uh, because he used to hang out baseball games. Um, Nixon uh, was babysitting uh, Julian David Eisenhower's kids in Philadelphia, and he lived next door to Richie Phillips, who's the head of the umpires union. And Richie calls Peter Ubroff, the, uh, the uh, Major League Baseball commissioner, and says, we're not getting anywhere. How about going to arbitration? So who you got in mind? Dick Nixon. Dick Nixon, get out of here. But Dick Nixon arbitrated the, uh, the dispute and gave the uh, umpires more money, and he's back into proper society. He becomes a senior statesman, and people go and enlisted his uh, advice, and also they want to know his opinion starting in 1985 because of that, and that was all because of Richie Phillips. The opening of the door to China. Well, you got to understand a couple things that go on here. China and the Soviet Union start splitting in 1960 over ideological differences. By 1968, Richard Nixon is running for president. He's making eyes at Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong is looking at who's going to win the presidency and decides to make eyes at the United States. Nixon wants this to happen. Mao Zedong wants it to happen. But how is it going to happen? Nixon goes to China in 1972, but something happened in 1971. A, a ragtag United States tennis table team travels to Red China or Communist China after there was a challenge to the Chinese squad in uh, the, Go, uh, the Yoga Japan uh, in April of 1971. It's called ping pong diplomacy and it produces a thaw in the United States, red or communist China relationship. Remember, 22 years, no Americans were in China. Now, during the 1971 World Table Tennis Championship, Nagoya, Japan, there was a 19-year-old player by the name of Glenn Cowan who hopped on the shuttle, and my wife knew him as a kid in New Rochelle, um, who played table tennis. Anyway, um, Glenn Cowan hopped on the shuttle bus carrying the red-shirted Chinese national team. Chuang Zhang uh, stepped forward to shake Cowan's hand after Cowan was on the bus for 10 minutes, spoke to him through an interpreter. Now, there have been some suggestions that this was all planned out by Nixon, Mao Zedong, whoever. Uh, because why, why did the Chinese team all of a sudden hand this guy a gift? So picture of, of the mountains. The next day, Cowan has a t-shirt, uh, the t-shirt with a peace symbol on it, and the Beatles' McCartney lyric of Let It Be. 
Cowling called himself a self-described hippie, but hippies were dead as of October 6, 1967. At least the diggers in San Francisco buried the hippies. And the hippies left nothing. There's no literature about the hippies. No writings, nothing. Just go to San Francisco and get high and have a good time. Anyway, uh, there's a breakthrough. And Mao says, come on down. You can next to see the Great Wall of China. All expense paid trip visit to China. The players check with the embassy. The embassy said, you're good to go. The players go. Oh, I was surprised as I was pleased. Uh, I never expected that the China Initiative would come to fruition in the form of a ping pong team. Nixon writes in his memoirs. On April 14th, the same day that uh, the players met with Cho Enlai, who was number two in China at that point, Nixon announced that the United States was easing its travel bans and trade embargoes against China. The American and Chinese governments soon opened new back channel communications with one another, and Nixon would go to China in 1972. That's Edith Green. She was a congresswoman, Democratic congresswoman from Oregon. She uh, was elected to the Congress in 1954, and Edith Green is one of the mothers in the House, along with Patsy Mink, a congresswoman from Hawaii, to write Title IX legislation, which allowed women to get the same equal educational opportunities as men in colleges, and that included sports. Um, Nixon signs the Title IX legislation June 23rd, 1972, and that's designed to give uh, women equal educational opportunities in American colleges and universities with men. It also deals with tenure and women getting uh, advancing in their college careers in terms of teaching to become full professors with tenure. But Title IX becomes a sports becomes a sports law, even though it wasn't supposed to be one. In fact, uh, Donna Deverona, I hate to drop names, she won two gold medals in the 1964 Tokyo Olympics and is a friend of mine and makes sure that I know what's going on with Title IX because she's up at Capitol Hill making sure Title IX has not changed. Uh, she told me the biggest mistake that uh, people ever made with Title IX was throwing sports in there. They should have just said educational opportunities. Anyway, Title IX, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Uh, the battle of the Title IX legislation goes on. Women's sports, uh, there's still a fight over whether women's sports is legit, if you could believe that. Uh, we're talking now 48 years after this was signed into law by Nixon, uh, with some coaches and athletic directors crying foul, saying we have to cut men's sports programs to make sure we have those women programs to stay in compliance with Title IX rules. Nixon was also very, very upset with Avery Brundage. Avery Brundage, who was the International Olympic Committee's president, who uh, Marty Glickman thought in 1936 gave the go-ahead to get rid of him and Sam Stoller in the 4x4 relays. Uh, he was very upset after um, the Munich 11, where nine Israeli athletes and two coaches were killed uh, in the Black September uh, takeover of uh, the Olympic Village where the Israelis were. The massacre, the Munich massacre, that was the first time you saw terrorism in your living room in the United States. Jim McKay, Jim McManus, Jim McKay was on for 14 hours ABC and did a masterful job, as did Howard Cosell, another guy I know, and I'm still friends with uh, his grandsons, Justin and Colin. Colin's the PA announcer for the New York Mets, and Peter Jennings. They were some of the main people covering what was going on uh, in the Olympic Village. Nixon writes a letter to Avery Brundage demanding the end of the Olympic Games for 1972. Uh, but Avery Brundage is going to have none of that. The games must go on. Uh, he, he goes on and gives a long and winded talk uh, a couple days later and has 27 words for our, our, our 
are Israeli friends. The games must go on. Hey, Nixon has nothing to do. This is 1972. This is a Sunday. You know, and he wants to, he wants to watch football like a lot of other people, right? You know, it's Sunday. His team, Washington, his friend George Allen is coaching the Washington team. And, and they're playing a playoff game against Green Bay. They're playing it in Washington. And he can't watch the game because of the blackout rule. And you would figure that the most powerful guy in the United States, Richard Nixon, would be able to see a football game in his residence in the White House. Or he could go up to Camp get David and get Baltimore TV, but he wants to stay at his residence to watch a football game. And he's getting very, very upset because he can't watch the football game. And the reason why, well, back in 1950, the National Football League Commissioner Burt Bell told his owners to black out home games, to get people to buy tickets for home games instead of sitting in front of the TV watching a football game, which is what Nixon wanted to do 22 years later. Bell's plea to his owners came after the Los Angeles Rams ownership saw a 50% drop in attendance in 1946, 49 rather, compared to 1948, because Admiral TV, some of you might remember the Admiral TVs, Admiral TV wanted to sell TVs in Los Angeles, and they thought they could do so by having Rams games on, 12 games, six home games, six road games. They would underwrite the losses of the Rams if they didn't bring in the same amount of money as 1948. And you went to your local Admiral dealer, your appliance store, and you could buy a TV and get a football card in Los Angeles. Uh, 1950, the blackout is back. In 1951, the NFL's in the courtroom, Alan Grimm's courtroom in Philadelphia. Uh, 1953, Judge Grimm said, hey, doesn't violate antitrust laws. Uh, it would come back in 1957 in Detroit, sellout of the championship game, with San Francisco, with San Francisco, I'm sorry, San Francisco playing Detroit, no game. So Nixon has nothing to do, and there is, uh, there he is, uh, and to his left is George Allen, and to his farthest left is Marv Levy, one of my favorite people from uh, Buffalo Bills, uh, the only NFL coach ever to have a degree from Harvard in English literature. Uh, you over-officiated over -officiated jerk, over-officious jerk, over-officious jerk, he said in NFL films. Hey, Dick Nixon wants to watch football. So he decides he's going to hatch a plot. I'll do this Jack Webb style. December 8, 1972, 2.06 in the afternoon, Nixon meets with Attorney General Richard Kleining Deese at the executive office building. The reason, I want to watch football. My friend George Allen's playoff team, his Washington team, they're playing Green Bay. I want to watch it, but I can't. And he doesn't. Uh, but Nixon pushes the NFL and pushes Congress. He wanted an intervention. He wanted to see that game. He wasn't able to see it. Uh, but there was um, some negotiations between the NFL and uh, the TV networks and Congress, and a compromise was reached. Uh, there would be blackouts if games were not sold out within 72 hours of kickoffs. Nixon signs off on the blackout law before the 1973 season. It's probably just as well because he wanted to watch football because of all the stuff going on with Watergate. Uh, the league adopted the 72-hour rule after the law expired, and to this day, it's there even though it's not an official rule. Gerald Ford is a, a college football Hall of Fame player. He played at the University of Michigan, became a lawyer and the president. And uh, he signs the law in 1976 because the NCAA believes in something called principles and amateurism and looks after athletes by keeping them away from the temptation of professionalism and commercialism and looks after the best interests of student athletes. The group got a special tax exempt status as a charitable organization under the IRS code, as well as Congress. Uh, colleges whose football teams appear at bowl games don't have to pay on uh, the revenue that they receive from the bowl games, nor do the conferences. So if you go to the Rose Bowl, the team gets uh, the money, doesn't have to pay taxes. The Big Ten doesn't have to pay taxes if they go to the Rose Bowl, and that goes for all the other bowl games. Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter, 1980. 
Jimmy Carter gives the Soviet Union an ultimatum, pull your troops out of Afghanistan by February 20th, 1980, or the United States would boycott the Summer Olympics that were scheduled for Moscow. On March 21st, the United States pulled out of the Moscow Games, joined by 60 countries in the boycott. And this is going on right at the time of the Olympic hockey tournament going on in Lake Placid, New York. First time the USA, USA chant, Lake Placid. It's a Friday afternoon. Nobody saw that game in the United States unless you were in the rank or you were on the border cities uh, where you got CBC, whether that would be, uh, say, Detroit or Buffalo, Niagara Falls. Um, or Plattsburgh, where you could see the game off the sea, uh, if you got CB CBC uh, there. Uh, the United States did not win the gold medal that game. The United States beating the Soviets allowed them to play in the game where they could win the gold medal. Carter would issue a trade embargo on two goods that the USSR desperately needed, grain and information technology, restricted Soviet fishing in American-controlled waters. The Soviets would pull out of Afghanistan in 1989. You could say the boycott was a failure. Ronald Reagan did two things in sports. I interviewed Ronald Reagan in 1980 before he caught fire in Bear Mountain, New York at an ice rink. And we got a chance to talk about all sorts of things. I was 23 years old. He was telling me about the days he was at WHO Radio in Des Moines, Iowa recreating Chicago Cub games, saying he had to mix some of it up because he lost the wire coming in, and he had pots and pans that he was hitting to make all kinds of noises. It was an interesting conversation I had with Reagan, and then we got down to brass tacks. I was working with WNW at the time, and I had to do the interview. Uh, we had a, I had a great conversation with Ronald Reagan in, in January of 1980. In 1984, President Reagan signs into law the cable TV Act of 1984, and what that did was socialize cable TV. Basically, you had basic, you had basic, you had basic expanded, two tiers. You could take uh, the basic tier, which was local stations, but if you wanted, say, ESPN or CNN back in those days, or the Weather Channel, you had to take the basic expanded tier, and you had to take all of it. You took all or nothing at all. Oh, Frank Sinatra song. Um, and that happened because of Reagan's signature. What happened there was the money all went to the, to the cable outlets, ESPN, CNN, from that extended tier. That extended tier, you didn't know what you were paying for. You had no idea, that, or you still have no idea, you're paying $7 a month for ESPN, about 75 cents a month for CNN, a buck for Fox News Channel, 50 cents for MS. NBC, like six cents for the Hallmark Channel. Uh, basically, the legislation saved those entities from financial ruin. And sports operators said, hey, wait a minute. We could take games from over-the-air TV and put them on cable and make money from that. All of a sudden, there's a new revenue stream for baseball. George Steinbrenner was able to sell or able to sell his rights to New York Yankee games by 1989 for $55 million a year, which was unheard of money in those days. Now, if you get $55 million a year, you're kind of poor. Uh, the other one was the, uh, was the Tax Code Act of 1986. And I just picked out Cincinnati because Cincinnati voters voted to build a baseball stadium and a football stadium side by side in Cincinnati, one for the Reds, one for the Bengals. And uh, the problem there was uh, the Tax Code Reform Act, uh, the Tax Reform Act of 1986, which opened a gigantic loophole in the tax laws and gave sports owners ammunition in their battles with cities and states to get stadiums and arenas. Under the right set of circumstances, an owner could get 92 cents out of every dollar that's generated within the stadium uh, from the signage and seats or the parking lots or the concessions. Um, and now all the teams have split up all those businesses into different businesses. Um, but uh, that would leave the municipality eight cents to pay down the debt. In Cincinnati's case, they never raised enough money, so they had to raise uh, property taxes, had to uh, sell off a hospital at 50%, municipal hospital, uh, and cut back on services 
uh, because they were not getting enough money uh, from the eight cents that they were left with uh, of every dollar that was generated within the stadium. And there was an enormous, enormous amount of building or rebuilding of stadiums with public money after that 1986 Reform Act. And also the law gave municipalities a federal tax exemption on bonds to build new stadiums. That is your tax dollars at work, the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library in um, College Station, Texas. And uh, it was the Bush administration of George W. Bush that sent me there. Condoleezza Rice signed me off to go there. That was the second uh, initiative that I did speaking uh, for the State Department. I did a, one in SUNY Cortland, upstate New York, uh, State University of New York at Cortland. And uh, I did that in uh, 2003, and I did that one in uh, August of 2007. Uh, your tax dollars at work, because they paid me, and they sent me there, and you paid for it. Uh, and I spoke to um, 16 uh, international students, all selected by the State Department. Uh, Gates was uh, the uh, Texas A&M Chancellor. He became Secretary of Defense. He signed off on me, Condoleezza Rice signed off on me. And I had to uh, explain the business of sports to three Indonesians, three Nigerians, three Venezuelans, three Turks, three Russians, uh, and one Canadian. And I kind of discounted him. Uh, and he laughed at that. But uh, they were five countries that are not exactly friendly with the United States. And they gave me the uh, job of explaining how the business of sports operates in the United States to those 15 students. Uh, in 1990, George H.W. Bush signed into law the Anabolic Steroids Control Act of 1990. The legislation made the possession of steroids without a physician's approval illegal, something that was totally ignored in Major League Baseball in the 1990s up through 2005. Technically, uh, anybody caught with an illegal substance could have gone to jail. Marion Jones ended up going to jail about lying about taking steroids. Uh, she the track and field star. Uh, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was involved with the 1994-95 baseball strike. Um, he had an impossible situation because those two sides did not like each other, had no trust for one another since uh, the 1960s. And he decides he's going to call them into the Oval Office, try to bang heads together, uh, try to get John Harrington and Donald Fear to agree to end the strike. Um, that doesn't happen. Uh, it's a complete failure. And uh, anybody who would have tried to do so would have failed. Uh, that strike was ended uh, in April of 1995 uh, down uh, at a New York State court because the National Labor Relations Board found that the baseball owners uh, were in violation of good faith bargaining. And uh, it was done in Sonia, Sonia, Sonia Sotomayor's courtroom. Uh, and she basically said, play ball. You know, she upheld what the National Labor Relations Board had ruled. And um, they went back to the drawing board, started the season, got a new deal going in 1995. Uh, he failed miserably. The Court Flood Act of 1998 signed into law by Clinton gave baseball players the same rights under American antitrust laws that basketball, football, hockey, and soccer players enjoy. George W. Bush, who I got to know as the managing uh, partner, general managing partner of the Texas Rangers, who really wanted to be the baseball commissioner in 1992, and Jerry Reinsdorf uh, said no, took Bud Sealing instead, so he went back to Texas, ran for governor in 1994. Uh, in the 2004 State of the Union address, there was a segment on steroids and athletes using steroids in sports. Um, Bush got Congress to get uh, hearings going uh, on the use of steroids in sports, uh, which eventually would have baseball come up with a uh, drug agreement with the Players Association for testing. Uh, the Bush administration and the Obama administration and the Trump administration have provided a good deal of security for Olympics, uh, particularly in 2004 for the Athens Greece Olympics. Most of the security for that was uh, part of the war on terrorism. And the other thing is uh, when athletes are compete in international competitions, uh, American armed forces have to protect them. I mean, it's like everybody else. American armed forces, uh, they take an oath to protect Americans both on 
uh, U.S. soil and uh, in international, uh, on international soil. Barack Obama tried to get the Olympics in 2020, 2016 for Chicago. He goes to Copenhagen in 2009. He wasted taxpayers' money because if you knew anything about the International Olympic Committee in 2009, it was going to uh, South America. It was going uh, to Brazil. Uh, it was the BRIC countries in those days that the International Olympic Committee really wanted. Their economies heated up. It was Brazil, it was Russia, it was uh, India, and it was China. Three of those four countries ended up with the Olympics. Uh, Obama talked about going to Copenhagen. I remember this vividly when Chicago had the bid for the 2016 Olympics. A very effective committee had flown to Copenhagen to make their presentation. And Michelle, Michelle Obama, had gone with them. I got a call, I think, uh, before the thing ended, but on fairly short notice that everybody thought if I flew out there, we would not have a chance, a good chance of getting it. And it might be worth essentially just taking a one-day trip. So we fly out there. Before I go on, 2005, Tony Blair, Prime Minister of Britain, genuflected before the International Olympic Committee and got the Olympics for London for 2012, the Summer Games. In 2007, Vladimir Putin genuflected in front of the International Olympic Committee to get the 2014 Sochi Games. The Olympic Committee wants the number one guy in the country. They don't want a committee. They don't want a surrogate. They want the number one guy. Uh, Lula from Brazil, and Obama said he was a rock star at that point, went and wowed the International Committee in Copenhagen, but they were going to give South America the Olympics anyway. Subsequently, according to Obama, I think we've learned the IOC's decisions are similar to FIFA, the governing body of soccer's decisions, a little bit cooked. I would say a lot cooked. I've dealt with them over the years. Uh, we didn't even make the first cut, despite the fact that by objective metrics, the American bid was the best. Obama, 109 years later, after Teddy Roosevelt, quote unquote, saved football, um, held a concussion summit to find out or to start the ball rolling to see if football, girls soccer, hockey, and cheerleading could be made safer. Girls soccer, for some reason, girls craniums are softer than boys craniums. Uh, and um, they are susceptible to concussions as little kids running around the soccer field. Now, there's an easy solution to that. Don't hit the ball. Don't hit the ball at all. Very easy solution. Football is a lot tougher. Hockey is a lot tougher. Cheerleading, believe it or not, throw the girls up and there's a lot of banging around. So there is this summit. Uh, this is shortly after uh, the uh, Dr. Dr. Amalu, Benin Amalu, found the, the little fluid in, uh, that leaked in the brains of deceased football players that probably gave them brain damage. Uh, they decided to talk about it in 2014. Um, nothing came of it other than Obama saying if he had boys, he wouldn't let them play football. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going on with concussions after that. It was even the uh, movie with Will Smith called Concussion. Uh, I know Amalu, and all of it has been tossed aside. You don't hear about concussions in football anymore. The NFL has done a masterful job in shutting down the discussion. And there's Donald Trump. I know, I've known Donald Trump since 1983, when he bought the uh, New Jersey Generals of the United States Football League. Among the things that he has done uh, as president that would have an impact, pledge support for the Los Angeles Olympics bid. The Los Angeles gets it, summer of 2028. California is putting up a quarter of a billion dollars to help out. Uh, Los Angeles is putting up a quarter of a billion dollars and the Trump administration has pledged a lot of money, a lot of which is going to protect uh, Los Angeles from terrorism attacks. Also the 2026 World Cup bid. Uh, by the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, he supported that. And again, a lot of money is going to go into making sure security is there for all the United States venues, which have not been picked out yet for the 2026 World Cup, which the United States, Canada, and Mexico will be hosting. They also pardoned Jack Johnson, the fighter from the 19-teens, heavyweight champion. 
uh, colored or Negro heavyweight champion who liked dating and marrying white women. And he was arrested. Uh, William Howard Taft signed the Man Act into law around 1910, 1911. It's aimed at Jack Johnson. Uh, it's for anybody who takes a woman over state lines for immoral purposes. Among the people who've been arrested for the Man Act, besides Jack Johnson, uh, who did do a year in jail and then went to uh, Europe to uh, do his boxing career, among the people who've been arrested or who've been charged under the Man Act, Charlie Chaplin and Chuck Berry, who spent two years in jail. Presidents have impacts. They do have impacts. You may say, hey, they don't, but they do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel, for inviting me. And Presidents Matter, from Andrew Johnson to Teddy Roosevelt, to Ronald Reagan, to Bill Clinton, to Barack Obama, to Donald Trump. Thank you, Rachel. Let's open it up. Any questions, any comments? Thank you so much, Evan. Evan, thank you. <laughs> we have any, uh, yeah, uh, anybody have any questions, any comments uh, that, uh, they uh, they have. Somebody's got to have questions. I'll make a comment. Go ahead, Howard. That today is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the NFL. Yes, it is. And it wasn't founded as the NFL. It was founded as no. the American professional. But that's when those five guys came together and started it all. At a, at a car dealer in Canton, Ohio. George Hallis sitting on a humpmobile and <laughs> doing that. So you're right. It's the 100th anniversary of the American Professional Football Association. And they changed their name to the NFL in 1922. And I'm going to give you this little tidbit because I did a commentary for Sunday on this. So I do a, a video podcast every day. Uh, the National Football League, because of Ronald Reagan's signature in 19. 86, the first time since 1920, all 32 teams are playing at football-only stadiums. 1920, the Cleveland Tigers played at Lee Park in Cleveland uh, on the baseball field where the Cleveland Indians play. So there is history that has been made, and you're right, 100 years. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate uh, your comment. Thank you, Lisa. Anybody else before I wrap it up? Well, I want to thank everybody uh, from uh, all over the place uh, who came. Uh, and I want to thank you, Rochelle, for inviting me. Hopefully, we could do this again at some point. And, yeah. and uh, I want to thank you. And uh, I, hope, uh, I hope it was uh, informative. And I hope some of the stories about William Howard Tapp, too, were uh, kind of funny uh, yeah. as well. Uh, it was very informative. I enjoyed it. While I'm watching the game, I'm glad I could mute it. <laughs> Cincinnati play. And, and, and who's responsible for you watching the game tonight? Um, NBC. <laughs> well, it's NFL Network. <laughs> NFL Network. It's John Kennedy. Because okay. John Kennedy's signature. John yeah. Kennedy okay. moved the NFL out of the uh, antitrust uh, violation area into the antitrust exemption area. For TV, so <laughs> able to watch the football game. Thanks to John. Okay. I want to. I want to thank everybody. I guess we have uh, nobody else. So thank you, Rochelle, for inviting me. Uh, I will make a recording of this and send it to you, and you can send it out uh, to your social media. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Evan.